Right, Bill, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So, Bill, we've been talking a bit about deception and people's ability to detect deception. And uh, one of the challenges that uh, people face is they often think they're, they're very good at detecting deception, but the research suggests that they're not. And one of the reasons is, is because people have a stereotype that's a bit inaccurate about what nonverbal behaviour should look like uh, when somebody's being deceptive. So they focus on all these things, but they're just indicators of nervousness. Yeah. And so this has kind of led people to conclude that um, uh, you know, people just generally are not very accurate at deception detection. Is that, is that really the conclusion we should draw from the research? Well, first of all, I definitely agree with you that people make a mistake of equating nervousness with deceiving. And of course, if you're interrogating me and I'm worried what happens if you don't believe me, I'll be nervous, even if I'm no, I know I'm completely innocent. So I think those data are all very reliable. But I think it's too big of an inference to then go on and say people can't detect deception. Now, I'm making this argument in the face of a huge database that shows that people can't do it. So, of course, that raises the question, why would you make such an argument? And I think the answer to that question is that the research has been done in a way that facilitated ease of research, but didn't facilitate matching real-world deception. So real-world deceptions are typically important. I'm not just lying to you about your haircut. I'm lying to you about something that if I'm discovered, I'll suffer for it. And they're often quite complicated. We eliminate all that in our typical research paradigm where we just videotape somebody who's telling a simple lie and then I watch the videotape and I try to say if they're telling the truth or not. It's great for experimental control. It's lousy for getting at the underlying dimensions of what really is involved when people deceive. So there's no, no real consequences in the lab for getting yes. it wrong, like when you're trying to figure out if someone's lying and, and for the liar themselves on the video, what, what's, what have they get vested in trying to dupe someone? That's right. They don't care if they're caught. And the lie they're telling is typically very simple. That they're asked, go in the professor's office, steal the wallet off the table, or don't. And then they have to claim they didn't. And we don't know which it is that they really did. So that's a super easy lie. I didn't take the wallet, right? You just keep saying that over and over again. And you're on videotape, and you're not going to suffer if people believe you did. But the real world, we often tell very complicated lies. They involve reshaping all sorts of world events so that I really wasn't at the bowling alley with your wife at that time or whatever the case might be. And it's very easy to get caught out in those. And so in our lab, we've done a little bit of work on this where we try to get people to engage in some very complicated lies and then see if people can detect them. And what we found to date is that, in fact, when people tell these complicated lies, there's a bit of a truth bias and people believe that they're true. They just automatically accept them. But as soon as we alert them to the fact that there was a lie that was told, people are very accurate in saying, well, in that case, I think you're the one who actually told this lie. Now, interestingly, in our initial study, interrogation didn't help. It was just their thinking back on the whole sequence of events and where the lie likely was that is what enabled them to discover it. But nonetheless, it shows that even when people initially accept something is true, they're actually quite capable when the lie is meaningful, the lie is complicated, and the lie is told to their face, they're capable of going back and finding it. So what did you do in your studies then that was different from like the prototypical deception study that makes it, um, you know, that improves detection deception accuracy? So in this particular study, we did a few things. First of all, they're always friends with each other. Because if you're not somebody's friend, you might not know when they're detect showing cues of cognitive load or raised pitch of their voice, the things that really are indicative of lying. Because you don't know what their voice usually sounds like. And you don't know how quickly they usually speak. So they're always groups of friends. And then we had them tell this complicated lie where they're involved with each other and they're trying to get their partners to make a bad choice. To It's an ambiguous situation. Nobody knows the answer. But they're pushing an answer that they know is wrong. But they're told you have to push it subtly, you'll get paid if your group buys your answer, but only if they don't detect you as a liar. So they're doing as gently as they can, but nonetheless, people know them well, and they get a chance to think, well, who was speaking more than they ought to have? They can go back and look for unusual events in the episode that took place and try to find the liar that way. Um, real life is often that way. Of course, it's often not. Maybe the lie took place in, in hidden circumstances, but then we can say, well, how well do the other circumstances fit with what the liar is trying to tell us? And I think that what these data show us is that interrogation, which we believe is really effective, may not be terribly effective, but our good knowledge about people and about the ways they usually behave actually can be very useful for us detecting, well, when are they trying to do something that's a bit different from what they would usually do? And so they're able to reasonably accurately detect deception even when they're not actively looking for it, just in retrospect thinking back. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in our case, we, um, we had 250 people in this experiment and 
Um, we asked them at the end of the study, once they had done their group decision-making task, not knowing that one of the group members was a saboteur, we say to them, okay, what's the study really about? It's not about group decision-making. So we, we, we were deceiving you. There's something else going on. Not a single person out of 250 said it was about deception and that one of the people here is a liar. Then we say, well, it's actually about deception. One of the people here is a liar. And when chance would be 50% if you set it up that way, they were way up like 75 or 80. And so, you know, the typical of chance is 50, you're at 53. You're not at 75. So it's clearly a case where now, even though they believed it the first time, they think back on all the complicated things that took place during that group discussion. There's something fishy here, and Blake, you're the one. Do you think um, like that knowing, knowing the person who's potentially deceptive is you know, one of the key factors because you've had feedback from previous interactions with them about you know, when they're being truthful and not? Uh, do you think feedback plays a role in, in uh, increasing their ability to detect deception? I think that, but I don't have any evidence for it. So it's our belief that you know, in the small groups that we evolved in, we always knew all the people we interacted with. So if we were trying to develop abilities, evolve abilities to detect deception, they're likely comparing the Blake that I'm watching now with the Blake I've known for a long time and making judgments about differences. And so when somebody's a stranger, you can't do that. We believe that plays a critical role, but we haven't run a study that involves strangers. So we don't know. We would, even our paradigm wouldn't work with strangers anyway. Um, people are awfully polite with strangers, and so they might not be willing to do the things that they're happy to mess around with their friends. But it's my suspicion that, that it matters a lot that you know the person, that we're good at comparing current to prior behaviors, that it matters a lot that the lie is important, so there's something really on the line, that it matters a lot that the lie is complicated, so that it's not just an issue of repeating over and over, I didn't do it. So to increase the, the uh, consequences, to increase the stakes of, of getting away with the deception, but also in detecting the deception, you paid your participants money. So um, can you just sort of tell us a little bit about how that worked exactly? Sure. So one of the people is a saboteur, and they're told, we'll pay you for every wrong answer you can convince your group to use. The group is paid for every right answer that they choose. So they're clearly across purposes for each other. Now, they're not paid much, a dollar per answer. The key with the saboteur, though, is that to really tell a lie, I have to not only convince you in the moment, but I have to convince you later on when somebody, when it discovers that somebody did have an affair with your wife, I don't want you to think it's me. And so they were told, you'll be paid a dollar for every wrong answer you convince your group if when they then find out there's a saboteur, they don't choose you. And so they could make an extra 10 or $15 if they could successfully lie to the group and convince the group even later on when interrogation took place, they're the only ones who knew eventually it will be revealed that there was a liar in here and they have to convince the group later on that that liar was not them. And do you think this, the money was the only thing that they were really sort of striving for and, and trying to get away with the lie? Look, the money was nice, of course, but I actually think that what really came down to was the social fun. They want to pull one over on their friends and prove that they could lie to them, and the friends don't want to have somebody pulling the wool over their eyes. And so the lab is right next to my office, and you would, when, the, when it was revealed that there was a saboteur, there was laughter and accusations and yelling and back and forth, and it was a lot of fun for them. And you could see they were bound and determined not to be found out, and they were also bound and determined to find out who it really was, and the few dollars probably made little difference. So, you know, maybe like the conclusion or, you know, one thing you might sort of take from your study then is really detecting deception is really a social thing. It's not, it's not an individual's, you know, uh, ability per se, but it's something that comes out of being in a social group and living, you know, living in a social context. That's exactly right. The deception is a social process just like truth telling is. And so truth telling is about making sure that you and I both understand the world as it really is. And deception is making sure that you and I understand a world that's favorable to me but is not how the world really is. Both of those are social processes. Sometimes I can get you on board and you would rather just go with me than really know the truth because your relationship is more important than the facts. Other times the facts are more important than the relationship. But in all cases, what we're trying to do is create these competing social realities that allow us to, in the end, understand what's really going on, but also in the end, be on the same page as each other. That's a fundamental human motive. Excellent. Thanks, Bill. Okay.